you ever see me staring at this thing is because I don't know when the countdown's over. Hi. <laughs> uh, I think it's on. Yes. So welcome to week one, part two of PS 101, Introduction to Astronomy, the online version. Um, making these recordings for students in my online class at St. Anselm College. However, I will be posting these online as well uh, for funsies for anyone else who's interested. Um, this is uh, part of the first week. We are still talking about the motions of things in the sky. <laughs> um, so far, uh, hopefully you've done the reading and worksheet and all that for part one. So you're a bit more familiar now with positions and motions of stars in the sky, as well as how the sun moves around the sky. We're going to talk more about the sun in particular now. Um, again, if you are doing along with the class, uh, you should do or should have done soon or the reading too, uh, which is a little more background on the same stuff I'm going to be talking about here and which will all help you complete worksheet number two. Again, there will be um, <clears throat> small sections of this PowerPoint that each correspond to a different part of that worksheet, if you are doing that. Um, starting off with the path of the sun, uh, we are talking about the path that the sun takes throughout our sky over the course of a day, and then how that changes uh, throughout the year, because the sun's not going to be in the same place necessarily uh, all year round. So uh, let's talk about where St. A's is in Manchester. Um, does the sun always rise exactly due east and set exactly due west? Um, think about that for a sec. Um, think about that where you are if you are not in northern hemisphere mid-latitudes. Um, when will the sun be exactly overhead in Manchester uh, or wherever you are? You can think about that for a moment. Um, this is the part of the class where I solicit ex uh, answers from the audience, but we're going to delve right into that now. Um, does not necessarily uh, rise exactly east and set exactly due west here in mid-northern latitudes um, most of the time. Um, and the sun is never directly overhead here in Manchester. Um, we're at a latitude of around 40. I should know that off the top of my head. I want to say 38 or 39. Um, so the sun is never actually uh, overhead or at the zenith uh, at noon. Um, it is always south of that at local noon. We'll um, look at why. Um, the sun's path through the sky is sort of like that of a star. So you've uh, already talked about how stars move around um, due to the rotation of the Earth. They appear to rise somewhere in the east and set somewhere in the west. Whether they circle around the sky above the horizon or go below the horizon depends on that star's distance from the celestial pole. Um, that measurement um, applies to the sun as well. It is on some point on the celestial sphere on any given day, meaning it has a certain distance from the celestial poles. Uh, I'm not going to get, yeah, I'm not going to get to the numbers too much, but for someone, so this diagram I'm showing here is for an observer uh, that is apparently shaped like a house um, at a typical mid-northern latitude again. Um, they are, this is showing how high the sun is in the sky at local noon for uh, different days of the year. So the black line is where the sun would reach its highest point. So imagine you're the observer, you'd have to look up that high into the sky, this angle here, here's that angle, do 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 do. Um, on the equinox when the sun this is the middle point of the sun's traversal throughout the sky um, the equinoxes are when uh, spring starts and fall starts um, so in the northern hemisphere spring starts around March 21st and fall starts September 21st uh, the when the sun is highest in the sky if you're taking this summer class now um, we've just passed the summer solstice uh, June 21st is when that begins here in the Northern Hemisphere. On June 21st, 
the sun's highest point in the sky is quite a bit higher than it was on the equinox. And on the winter solstice, the first day of winter in the northern hemisphere, December 21st, the sun only gets yay high, not nearly as high as it does those other days. Now you're probably already familiar with the concept of a solstice uh, and an equinox as being the beginning of a season. The solstices are particularly important because uh, we think of the summer solstice as the longest day of the year. The sun is in the sky for the most amount of hours. Uh, for the winter solstice, for us, the sun is in the sky for the least amount of hours. It's the shortest day. This has drastic effects on our weather. Again, New Hampshireites, it snows a lot in, this, in the winter um, because of those cold temperatures. So just looking at one point in time, one point during the day, uh, shows you a wide variation in how, the, how high the sun can get in the sky. And there's a very special particular measurement here, this 23.5 degrees between each equinox, between each solstice and the equinox in the middle, um, that's the tilt of the Earth's axis. That's how far the Earth is tilted over on its side compared to its orbit going around the sun. That'll be important in our next section. If you, so this is showing one point in time, if you stretch that out over the course of a day and look at the sun's path throughout the sky over the course of a day, again, this is a, a typical mid-northern mid -northern latitude. It's probably a bit more north than, than we are here. I can't remember if this is the more north or more south, but typical mid-northern latitude, let's say, around 40 degrees. Um, uh, in the northern hemisphere, for the on the day of the, the on the day of the summer solstice, the sun is going to. So if you're facing this this green arrow pointing kind of into the screen is facing south. Um, again, for a northern hemisphere observer, so if that's south, east is over here, in here. So your sun on the solstice is rising. See, it's all red and orange because it's sunrise. Uh, rising in the east, traversing, I think I'm getting the, yeah, rising in the east, traversing the sky, that's that highest point that we saw right around here um, at local noon, and then comes back down and sets uh, over in the west. Um, but as you see, not directly west, more like northwest. If you trace the sun's path through the sky on the winter solstice, it's going to rise here. Uh, again, it's gonna be that little red-orange sunrise. Go through the sky, get to its highest point, which isn't nearly as high as it was in the summer. And then set here, which is like south of west. Um, so you notice a couple things. One, uh, the sun's higher in the sky uh, in the summer than in winter. And two, the sun's up for longer in the winter than in the summer. And that's gonna have, again, very important effects um, for those of us here on Earth using the sunlight to live and things like that. This is another uh, way of looking at it. This visualization shows you a sphere. It shows uh, a lower, uh, the blue line, uh, again, for Northern Hemisphere Observer, winter solstice, um, that's the sun's path, and it just shows you it rotates that thing around, um, looks like 45 degrees. Yeah, it looks like it's rotating 45 degrees in each one. Um, the equinox, so both the green spring equinox and the orange autumn equinox are on top of each other. Uh, and then the summer solstice is when it gets higher in the sky. Notice, for a typical mid-northern latitude, the sun is never at the zenith. It is never at the straight overhead for those of us observers um, who were at around, whatever, 30, 40 degrees latitude. Um, one way you can plot that, and again, if you're doing the worksheet, you will see an example of this on your worksheet, is to look at uh, how you can use the sun's, sh uh, the shadow um, created by the sun on a pin or like some vertical structure. This looks like a pretty small one. Um, that shadow will tell you where in the year you are based on where that end of that shadow is. Um, so it could have a really short shadow, meaning the sun is higher overhead. So that's the, um, it's higher overhead, that's the summer solstice. 
Uh, you can have the shadow be very long all day, meaning that the sun is low in the sky, so it's probably on the winter solstice, and everywhere in between. I'm gonna go back a slide for a sec. So every day from the winter solstice to the spring equinox, the sun is rising slightly higher and higher and higher every day uh, until it reaches that point. So the sun's path for every day of the year she fills in all of that band if you had to color all those in. Uh, there are some special latitudes to, uh, to keep in mind. So I've been pretty much just talking about mid latitudes, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. You have a very similar situation if you are 30, 40, 50 degrees south of the equator in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but there are some special locations on Earth which make the sun do, uh, sun's path through the sky quite a bit different um, based on where you are. So because of that 23 and a half axis tilt, the important latitudes are related to that number. Uh, the Tropic of Cancer, so Northern Hemisphere, is, <coughs> excuse me, 23 and a half uh, degrees above the equator. Um, I think the entire contiguous United States is above that line, um, but the Tropic of Cancer marks a point where you can ha have the sun overhead on a particular day of the year, in this case, the summer solstice. So the sun is directly overhead at noon on the summer solstice for everybody living on that line. And for everybody living s between that line and Tropic of Capricorn, which is the southern hemisphere version, the sun will be overhead at noon at least one, possibly two days a year. If you are in a very northern or very southern latitude, something else happens. 23 and a half degrees from the North Pole puts you at 66.5 degrees latitude. That's the Arctic Circle. Uh, for observers on the Arctic Circle, there is one day a year where the sun doesn't set. <laughs> on the summer solstice in the Arctic Circle, you get sun all day long. Uh, this effect becomes more extreme the closer and closer you get to the pole, such that uh, at the North Pole in the summer, uh, you're going to get the sun up all summer. Um, and in the winter, you're going to have all darkness, so six months of darkness. Um, so uh, again, these are very extreme conditions to live under. Um, and the uh, opposite of that is the Antarctic Circle, which again is the southern version and pretty much covers the, the continent of Antarctica. So for you lucky, fun, adventurous folks who've done that, you, um, they have all the sunlight all the time uh, during their summer working season. But it's, it's fun to kind of think about what does this look like for somebody at these latitudes? So here's an example. Um, at the pole, this could be either pole, um, we can say it's the North Pole um, for now. Um, the sun remains above the horizon from the spring equinox to the fall equinox. It just goes round and round the sky because again, your North Celestial Pole is overhead. Everything's going around that. The sun's going to go around the sky for you. If you're on the equator, which is probably more likely place you're going to find yourself at an equator than at a pole, but who knows. Um, the sun uh, will go straight up and set straight down. Not necessarily right on the east and west directions, that'll happen on the equinox, um, but it'll go straight up and straight down. This is showing both of the solstices. Um, so if you're at the equator, uh, on one solstice, it's going to do this. The other solstice is going to do this. The equinox is going to go right up the middle of the sky and go overhead. Um, so no matter what season it is, if you're on the equator, you're getting a lot of sunlight. Hey, that might have something to do with the fact that the equator, uh, lands of the equator are so warm. So the highlights for this. The sun's path throughout the sky over the course of a day can be plotted, right? With a bunch of dots or a line sort of like you did for a single star in your previous activities. Uh, the sun's path throughout the day isn't the same every single day. Uh, it changes slightly from day to day uh, and ultimately from season to season. And the sun's path through the sky depends on your latitude on Earth. 
Um, if you're doing the worksheet activities to go along with that, uh, it does again assume a mid northern latitude. I'm so sorry for everybody else. Uh, although again, it works um, pretty much the same if you're at a mid latitude, uh, mid latitude in the southern hemisphere. So going from studying the path of the sun in the sky, we get to the seasons. So what is the reason <laughs> that we have seasons? Why does the Earth have seasons? Um, interestingly enough, this is not as, as simple as one might think. Um, a lot of people have a preconceived notion in their head of how they think the seasons work. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of direct experience to counteract uh, that notion that a lot of people have. I think a lot of people will tell you is, oh, well, it's summer because uh, we're closer to the sun. And it's cooler because we're further from the sun because the Earth is in an elliptical orbit. Uh, that's not the case. Although, like I said, that's a very popular um, conception. Uh, so this is showing a very exaggerated ellipse for the Earth. Um, and uh, it is, it, this, this is incredibly exaggerated. It is not this different. Um, but you just have the numbers, 147 million kilometers is the closest we are to the sun, and 152 million kilometers is the furthest we are from the sun. Uh, sounds like a big difference, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of a difference. Um, but notice we are closest in January. We are closest in January and furthest in July. So that right off the bat gives us a little problem with our idea that, oh, the, it's summer when it's closest. Also, if you have friends who are geographically spread, you may already know that as the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing one season, the Southern Hemisphere is experiencing the opposite season. So right now it is summer here in the Northern Hemisphere when I'm recording this. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, all of our, our friends down in Australia, South Africa, South America, they are enjoying winter. They're enjoying their cooler temperatures right now or snow, depending on how far south. Um, so again, the idea that the Earth is closer in summer and further in winter doesn't hold up, because that doesn't explain why we have different seasons at the same time. So we're gonna interrogate that a little bit more. Again, if you're doing the worksheet along, along with this, uh, these videos, uh, you will be interrogating that process through a series of questions on the worksheet. And what we do see is um, again looking at these solstices and equinoxes and see so the days that we decide begin the seasons uh, this has something to do with it so the sun's path throughout the sky as we looked at before uh, is higher for the summer solstice lower in the winter solstice um, it's up longer in the summer and up less in the winter um, so the summer solstice is that highest path rises and set at the most extreme north of due east for those of us in the northern hemisphere. The winter solstice is the lowest path, rises and sets south of east. The equinox is it rises precisely east and sets precisely due west. It doesn't go straight up and down, it's still tilted, um, but goes around to kind of like a middle high uh, in the sky at noon. So again, uh, same plot as before, same text as I just had on the previous slide, just showing you winter solstice. And then again, you know, if that's December 21st, December 22nd is a little higher and December 23rd is a little higher. Um, uh, we are at, if I'm recording this now in the beginning of July, we're just a little bit under that summer solstice path. Um, now let's step away from our point of view on the earth a bit and take a look at this in this wildly not to scale drawing uh, of the sun and the earth going around the sun. Um, so this is showing the Earth's, Earth's position at these four special points in time. Uh, again, we're going to define things by the Northern Hemisphere. We have the summer solstice here, the winter solstice here. So if we're going this way, summer turns into autumn equinox, winter turns into spring equinox. Um, the tilt, notice the tilt of the Earth's axis is always in that same direction. Uh, as it goes around the sun. Now if we zoom out from this a bit and look at the sun's rays falling on the earth at each of these times, 
Here's the summer solstice over here. The sun's rays are um, more falling more directly on all of these northern hemisphere locations. See the equator is halfway across the Earth. These northern hemisphere locations getting a lot more direct sunlight than these southern hemisphere locations. At the winter solstice, for those of us in the northern hemisphere, the northern latitudes are getting less of the direct sunlight and the southern latitudes are getting more direct sunlight. So it's winter for us and summer for them. And those are the kind of the, the two extremes that I'm showing you. So you get more direct sunlight when you're closest to a summer solstice um, at your latitude than if you're close to a winter solstice. You also get the sun at a different altitude. Talked about this in the last activity, I'm gonna show it again. Uh, this is uh, another one of those pictures of the position of the sun in the sky at the same time. Um, not every day, but for a bunch of days throughout the year. Uh, at noon in the summer, it's going to be at its highest. At noon in the winter, it's not going to be very high at all. Um, this is the kind of thing, unless you go out of your way to pay attention to, you don't really notice. Fun fact, I'm going to get into a little story. Um, I decided in high school to do an observing project about sunspots. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it was in high school in winter, and I did not know these things about astronomy at the time. Uh, and it was winter. I was all excited because, you know, I'm like, I'll set up my telescope in like midday and the sun will be at its highest in the sky and I'll point up and safely, not directly, but safely observe the projection of the sun and the sunspots and it's going to be great. Um, I did not take into account the fact that the sun doesn't get very high in the sky in winter. I didn't know that. Even if you know that, you don't really know it until you're trying to find how high the sun is um, above all of the tall buildings in your neighborhood uh, and, and having to sneak your telescope in between the buildings um, to get a glimpse of the sun. So, uh, you know, it's, it sounds kind of obvious the way I'm saying it, but until you try and go out of your way to observe it, you don't always notice that, yeah, the sun's a lot lower in the sky in the winter than it is in the summer. Usually we're too busy trying to get from place to place without freezing. So the tilt of the Earth is what's behind these effects, how we see the sun. So because the Earth is tilted, that's why we see the sun high and long uh, in the sky in what we consider summer and not as high or as long in the sky um, in the winter. And the tilt also determines whether we get direct sunlight. So this is showing direct sunlight on the southern hemisphere, southern summer, low density or indirect sunlight in the northern hemisphere uh, for those of us uh, who are, would be experiencing winter at that time. So the tilt of the Earth is the cause of both of these, but those are the two main driving factors um, for the reason for why we have seasons. So to summary, or highlights, Earth's axis points in the same direction. I said to Polaris, nothing special Polaris, about Polaris, just happens to be the sun, the star that's in that direction um, all year round. So its orientation relative to the sun changes as it orbits the sun. Cool. Summer occurs in your hemisphere. <laughs> when sunlight hits it more directly, winter occurs when sunlight is less direct. The axis tilt is the key to the seasons. It's not distance. Without that tilt of the axis, we would not have these seasons on Earth. Kind of weird. All right, we're going to pull away from the sun now uh, and talk some more about the night sky and how you uh, view the night sky. There's a short activity on the work uh, worksheet that corresponds with this. Um, basically showing you how to use a star chart. Um, for this class, uh, you have an observing project due um, at the end of the semester. Hope you've already read the instructions for that. Uh, if you uh, choose the option where you do outdoor observing, you're gonna want a star map. It's really helpful. Um, I always print out these particular maps I'm showing on the screen from skymaps.com. Free star maps updated every month, show you where all the stars are, all the planets are, for different locations on Earth. So the those of you taking this class, if you are not too far away from, from uh, St. Hayes, if somewhere in the continental US, you're probably gonna want the Northern Hemisphere mid-latitudes map, but they make maps for everywhere, um, pretty much everywhere, 
in the world. Uh, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, near the equator, mid-latitude, that kind of thing. Don't know if they specialize in polar maps, so sorry if you're uh, in Antarctica. Um, it's a useful star chart. You have to, again, um, think three-dimensionally on a two-dimensional surface. Not the easiest thing to do. But we've described the sky around us as the inside of a dome. Um, you have to imagine that dome projected onto a circle on that screen uh, or on that piece of paper if you print this out and take this out with you. The main things you need to know about using a star map are you need to pick a star chart that corresponds with your time and your latitude. So uh, skymaps.com, again, you can pick by latitude very roughly. They put out a new one every month. Um, and it tells you what time at night <laughs> that accurately represents the sky. If you're out a couple hours before, well, if you're out a couple hours before in July in the Northern Hemisphere, you're not going to see anything because it's still light out. Um, but if you're out a couple hours after, things may have shifted a little bit from how they look in here. Um, but for most of us, we're, we're going out, you know, not too long after sunset. Uh, or not out till 2 or 3 a.m. looking at the stars unless you uh, have a telescope. Um, to read this star chart properly, because it's this two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional inside of a dome around your head, uh, you have to pay attention to the directions. So there are directions indicated around that circle. Um, whatever direction you're facing, standing here on Earth, uh, yeah, it helps to have a compass or a local guide uh, who can tell you what direction you're facing or just pay attention to where the sun set. That gives you roughly where west was. Um, that's the part of the map you want to rotate so it's at the bottom of your circle. So the way this map is printed and shown on the screen, south is at the bottom. This works if you're looking south. You start to look up in the sky, you'll start to see these constellation patterns. The zenith is marked on this one with a tiny little cross. Um, that's your overhead point, but you can rotate this map around as you look at different directions. You're going to get a little practice with that if you're doing the worksheet. Um, hopefully you can get out uh, to one of the outdoor observing opportunities uh, and you can do a little practice with that as well. A little bit of extra on that, um, which uh, don't get too much into, is the coordinates on the sky. So I briefly mentioned the last, the last mini lecture. You can talk about how high a star is above the horizon and how far away it is from north. But stars move throughout the night sky over the course of the day, so those change. Um, we have a set of coordinates on the celestial sphere itself. So, excuse me, some sky maps will list those uh, coordinates. They're called right ascension and declination. Declination of a star is how high it is above the celestial equator, which is mapped out from the Earth's equator. So declination is kind of like latitude on Earth. Right ascension is how far uh, it is from a particular point on the sphere. So at zero hours, it's the meridian. Um, that's kind of like longitude on Earth. I'm not going to expect you to know a whole lot about that. But what's interesting is if you know the declination of a star or something uh, on the celestial sphere, that tells you how it's going to move through your sky at night. So we talked about this before. Uh, the north celestial pole uh, will appear stationary for observers in the northern hemisphere. Stars close to that will go around in these circles, never rising and setting. Stars further away will rise and set. Well, the declination of the North Celestial Pole is 90 degrees, just like the latitude of the North Pole on Earth is 90 degrees. Um, and so if you have a, a star declination that's in the high 80s, it's probably circumpolar. Um, and of course, whether or not it's actually circumpolar depends on your latitude on Earth. Um, but that star's path depends on your latitude and its own declination. The main highlight for this section, though, is that a star chart lets you determine the position of objects in the sky for a specific location and a specific time. 
right. our last bit of uh, on what I call naked eye observing, because you don't need a telescope or binoculars to see any of these things we're talking about yet, are the phases of the moon. Phases of the moon is another one of those concepts that everyone's familiar with. Uh, we've seen the moon in, in one way or another. Um, but understanding why it looks the way it does is a little bit tricky because it has to do with three-dimensional geometry. So if we take a step back away from our position on Earth. So if the sun is in this diagram up at the top, coming from way above, the Earth is chugging along on its orbit around the sun. The Earth has this special moon uh, that is orbiting the uh, Earth while the Earth orbits the sun. Um, the phases of the moon are a consequence of that orbit. This diagram shows you a little extra bit of it, which is that uh, it takes 27.3 days for the moon to go around uh, the Earth. But just like the last thing we talked about, where you have to turn the Earth a little bit more to put the sun overhead because it's moving, you, you, the moon has to go a little bit more around until you see all the phases. It's a month, plus or minus. Not a big deal. I'm not going to make you um, worry too much about the details of that. But we're going to focus on the location of the Earth. The Earth is spinning, you know, every 24 hours. The location of the moon, which is going around every, we'll just roughly say month, um, while the Earth is moving around the sun. So, it's the relative position of the moon with respect to the Earth and the sun that gives rise to phases. When we're at a new moon, that's when we don't see the moon at all. The moon hasn't gone anywhere. But here we are on Earth. You can imagine you're a little person standing on the planet looking up at the moon. And the Earth rotates 24 hours, so this all happens faster than the moon's moving. If you look at the moon, if you look at that image of the moon in the picture right there, you notice the sun is shining on the top half and not shining on the bottom half. The moon isn't giving off its own visible light, it's just reflecting sunlight. But it can only reflect sunlight from the half that's facing the sun. So the side that's facing us is dark. It's nighttime on that side of the moon. So when we try and look for the moon in the sky, we won't see it because it's not reflecting any light. Also, it happens to be really close to the sun at that point. So eh, it's going to be hard to see anyway. Um, let's skip ahead to full moon. This is the opposites kind of help give you a little bit more of an effect. Um, we're here. The moon's here. Uh, the sun is shining on the moon. Uh, it looks like the Earth is in the way, but in reality, all of these angles are a little bit so that the moon's a little bit higher. Um, it's not being directly blocked. If it is, there's an eclipse, and that's rare. But um, we're, we're going to talk about the uh, common times when there's no eclipse. The sun is shining on this part of the moon, that front part, that top part. That's the part that's facing Earth. So, hey, we see a full moon. We see all of that sunlight uh, reflecting down on us. How it gets there, as the moon slowly rotates around the Earth, we see more and more of the part that's illuminated. So in this crescent phase, we see a little bit of illumination. Um, in this first quarter phase, which is a quarter of the moon, or looks like half of a circle, we see this half lit up. Again, this is for Northern Hemisphere observers. Um, that gets bigger until you get to a full moon, and then it gets smaller as you go back around to new moon. What we call these, um, we call these phases, when they're getting bigger <laughs> from night to night, we call it waxing, waxing. Uh, and when it's getting smaller, we call it waning. Um, when it, we see half of it, uh, or a half circle, we call it a quarter moon, either a first quarter, or last quarter, also known as third quarter, when we don't see anything, it's a new moon. When we see the whole thing, it's a full moon. Uh, if it makes a tiny sliver, it's a crescent. If it makes a bulbous shape that's not quite full, but bigger than first quarter, it's called gibbous. That just, the word gibbous just means 
the shape that's kind of bulbous but not a circle um so we see a changing combination of the part that's lit up and the part that's dark as the moon goes around the sun this is, is an incredibly difficult um concept to get just by listening to me yammer about it uh, one of the best ways to do this is to get a bright light source. Um, I've got one of my super, super bright lamps over here. Um, and a spherical object, some kind of ball. And set up the lamp as your light source with no other light sources around. Uh, and, and you're the earth, your head's the earth, that light source is the sun, and the ball that you have is the moon. Move that around, let it orbit around your head and see how much of that ball is reflecting the light from your single light source. Honestly, all the computer simulations in the world um, had done nothing for me over the years. Doing the ball around the head thing uh, has been what has helped me the most. I will have instructions on how to do that in the optional materials section, um, but literally you just get a ball and a light source and make the ball go around your head as if it's the moon going around the earth. Um, and I think you can Google how to do that pretty easily as well. Uh, so again, just some vocabulary. Um, I care less that you know, well, I mean, crescent and gibbous are two good things to know. Uh, waxing and waning are two good words to know as well, because as uh, the moon, um, excuse me, brains just stopped working. Uh, as it's <laughs> the visible part or the reflective part's getting bigger, it's waxing, smaller, it's waning. A uh, couple ways of looking at it. Uh, on the left side of this image, it's showing you a model of what those phases look like from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, new crescent, first quarter, uh, waxing crescent, waxing gibbous specifically, full, waning gibbous. That's third quarter. I've not heard anyone else call it second quarter except for this one diagram. Awesome. Uh, crescent or new. If you say second quarter somewhere, I won't, I won't be mad. Um, but it usually says third quarter. If you are an observer sitting outside of Earth looking at the moon, what do you see? You see the sun here, you see the Earth here, half the Earth is lit up all the time, that's the part that's in daytime, half the moon is lit up all the time. What we see here on the left is from an Earth observer's perspective. What an alien spaceship orbiting Earth would see would be a completely different perspective, right? So you're not, they see that half the moon is always lit. Um, if you're doing the worksheet, you'll get a little bit into this. Uh, the l if, you, if you're doing this class and getting, there was a phases of the moon lab that is part of this week's activities, you'll go through this step by step. Um, and I think it even makes you do the ball around your head part. Um, so it'll give you more of a chance to, to work with these concepts. As you do that, you learn some fun things. Uh, you can tell what, either what time it is, if you know, if you look at the moon, see what phase it's in and see how high it is in the sky. You could guess what time it is. Or, um, yeah, if you know the time and the moon phase, you should be able to figure out where to find the moon. Um, so that's a little weird way of saying it. But what time it is on Earth, right, is determined by uh, where the sun is in the sky. When the sun's overhead, it's local noon. The sun's opposite of overhead, it's midnight. Uh, this is a very rough guide, right? Saying 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is sunrise and sunset. Where the sun is in the sky determines what time it is. Where the moon is in the sky determines what phase it is. So if the moon has to be here for it to be full, the full moon's always gonna be at its highest right around midnight when it's opposite the sun. The new moon's always gonna be at its highest at local noon, right there next to the sun. Um, the first quarter moon is going to be highest overhead at, we'll just say sunset, around 6 p.m. Um, third quarter moon uh, is one that's gonna be highest overhead at 6 a.m. So if you know what time of month it is with respect to the moon, what time it is, you can start to see that, that a pattern emerges. Um, yes. So the phases, the highlights, the things I really want you to take away from this, the phases of the moon, as observed from Earth, because that's what we care about right now, are determined by the relative positions of the sun, Earth, and moon. There's no shadows going on. Nothing's hiding behind anything else. That's how you get eclipses, which is a different topic. 
Uh, the moon phases indicate how much of the moon's illuminated surface is visible from Earth. Uh, notice, again, in this diagram, it's showing you the way the moon looks for an alien in a spacecraft orbiting, orbiting the Earth-Moon system. You know, some half of the moon is always lit, right? Uh, the moon is, um, has some part of it that's in daylight and some part of it that's in nighttime. So, uh, as with last time, I will see you on the message boards. Uh, feel free to send me your questions uh, and get to work on those worksheets. I don't know where the stop button is. There it is.